for Student Affairs, uh, who's joined us today, Pat Terrell. Thank you, Pat, for doing that. And uh, the Vice President for Health Sciences, our new Vice President, Rex Force, and then also the Chief Financial Officer, report now to the Provost and Executive Vice President. And so that change uh, happened in August. The State Board approved that transition. And part of what we want to talk about today is what that means for how the Office of the Provost functions and what that means for academic planning. <laughs> so this is essentially what I want to accomplish today. And that includes providing updates uh, related to accreditation. And I know you're all going to get super excited about this, although some of you are on the Strategic Planning Task Force. But updates to strategic planning and our renewed commitment to the academic mission at ISU as part of this restructure. The shared vision uh, that together we can build mutual trust and cooperation throughout this endeavor. And to reinforce my commitment to the faculty's role in academic policies and other administrative planning processes, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Introduce a couple of new initiatives and provide time to answer questions that you might have. Oh dear. I think Darren told me not to, to use the back and forth buttons, but help me. <laughs> I used to be much more proficient when I taught all the time, but somehow when you spend all your time in meetings, you become less proficient, as you all know, about administrators anyway. There we go. So I do need to update you on our accreditation process. I know that this is not of great interest to everyone, but it is very exciting because we have been through our seven-year site visit that happened uh, more than a year ago now. We had our seven-year site visit reports. We were re-accredited for the next seven years. The Northwest Commission is, of course, our regional accreditor. As you all know, regional accreditation is the gold standard for accreditation in the U.S. That process now is, start, has started over. And so the Northwest Commission has an ongoing continuous improvement cycle. After year seven, we are back with year one. We had our year one self-evaluation in the spring of 2016. And that was approved by the, state, by the State Board of Education as well. Part of what we had to do was rewrite the mission and the core themes, revise them. They didn't change dramatically. We did that last fall through a process that included interaction with all of you, with the faculty senate, with the deans, and we had a lot of feedback on our mission statement that was revised and then approved by both the Northwest Com Commission and the State Board. This is no small accomplishment, actually, because in the past we have had many uh, versions of the mission statement before it was approved at the state board level. So we're very excited about this and a lot of that credit uh, goes to our accreditation liaison officer Selena Grace who is, has joined us here. So congratulations Selena for getting that through. We're very excited about our mission statement. You all made some great changes to it but we think it does reflect the institution and now we're moving forward with a revised strategic plan process that I'll say a little bit about. We also, rec we also dealt with a couple of recommendations that we had from the Northwest Commission when they visited us. One of those was to revise the mission statement, as I mentioned before. Another of those recommendations was to build, and I'm quoting here, on the governing framework by promoting an environment of transparency and collegiality resulting in trust. We had to respond to that in the, just uh, in our spring report, standard one report. We did that by talking about a restructure that we had for planning, campus planning, institutional effectiveness and assessment council, the creation of that council with the vice presidents and standard, our core theme subcommittees. I have some slides about that structure here in a moment. The, IAC committee, we utilized that to demonstrate that we're aligning planning across the campus as a whole. So what our Northwest Commission cited 
us for when they visited us was that we had a master plan that had not been approved by the state board. We had, and that's more of a facilities plan, we had an academic plan, a five-year academic plan that's required by the state board. They approve that every August. We had local plans. We had IT plans <coughs> and college plans and some department strategic plans. And the Northwest Commission site visitors said, we don't understand how these plans fit together. And we're pretty sure you don't either. And you know they were right. We we didn't understand because they don't really they weren't in alignment. So we're utilizing this new structure to align those planning processes, so that the academic mission is the central plan, and IT, and budget, and facilities, and all of the other plans that we have on campus are in support roles to that academic mission. Now I do want to say that the Northwest Commission accepted that framework as appropriate for having a, the planning <coughs> process and they lifted recommendation number two as a result. So we were told that recommendation number two had been met. Now we're happy about that, I'm very pleased that recommendation number two has been met, that they won't ask us about this again, uh, maybe until our next seven year site visit. And that's all a good thing. But we also know that there are still our concerns about transparency and about communication. And as a result, that doesn't mean that we're done working on this issue. So I just want you all to know that we've met that requirement from the accreditation perspective. That's a good thing. But we'll continue to work on it on campus. We also had a recommendation about general education assessment, and that was because our general education goals at the state level were being revised during our seven-year site visit. We knew we were going to get a recommendation on this because we did not have an assessment plan for a general education framework that had not yet been approved at the state level. It was approved about a month after our site visitors left campus, and since then, our General Education Requirements Committee, GERC, and Curriculum Council have worked to create an assessment plan. That plan was submitted to the Northwest Commission last spring and they accepted that as an appropriate assessment plan. And as a result, they have lifted recommendation number five as well, which kind of surprised us actually. We were expecting the Northwest to say this is a great a plan for assessment, but we want you to demonstrate that you're actually doing it. And they, they didn't ask us to do that, so they accepted the plan because our faculty did a great job with that framework, so we're, we're pleased about that. So what is the Institutional Effectiveness and Assessment Council? This is that body, planning body that we restructured last year after our site team left and in response to these concerns they had about lack of aligned planning. And you haven't heard very much about it yet because it spent its time last year mostly in dealing with standard, the standard one changes for the mission statement and the core themes and also on these various recommendations that we had to address with accreditation. So it spent its time on accreditation issues. But going forward, you'll hear a lot more about this planning body because it also is responsible for IT planning uh, at the at the 60,000 foot level and also budget planning. It is the budget committee for the campus. It has replaced the special budget consultation committee and it manages facilities planning as well. So the IAC steering committee oversees a number of subcommittees that report to it and it's chaired by myself it also has a number of members that are subcommittee chairs. Uh, Brian Hickenlooper, our CFO, is the finance subcommittee chair. Uh, Niels, our vice president for research, is core theme one. Core theme one, if you'll recall, is learning and discovery. Uh, Rex is core theme number two, uh, core theme three, that's leadership and health sciences. Uh, 
Pat is core theme two, <coughs> city chair. That's access and opportunity. And Kent Tingey is core theme four. That's a social a outreach, essentially our outreach function. And Randy Gaines is the technology subcommittee chair. Cheryl Hansen is the facilities subcommittee chair. Selena Grace serves on this committee in her role as the accreditation liaison officer. So her job is to make sure that planning is consistent with accreditation. All of these subcommittee chairs are responsible for ensuring that we have effective core theme planning. So that if we're doing something in budget or facilities or IT, that is consistent with our mission and, and it's consistent with our core themes. And as such, then these core theme subcommittee chairs, it's our responsibility to say that this initiative is consistent or not with learning and discovery, for example. And then we have dean representatives, those are to be determined. The dean's council is working on its representation for IAC. Vince Miller attends this meeting because he handles data. He's the, our data director, of course, and is there to make sure that he can provide the data that we're talking about needing, essentially. Uh, athletics, of <coughs> course, we have a student from ASISU. Our faculty senate uh, co-chairs are members that they've chosen to send uh, Paul to this particular committee, and HR is a member as well. We have faculty members on all these core theme subcommittees, as well as the technology, the facilities, and the finance subcommittees. So if you've been asked to serve on one of these subcommittees, or your dean has sent something out to the college and said, we need people to serve on these subcommittees, now you know what that was about. And if you're interested in serving on these subcommittees, I would definitely encourage you to talk to either your faculty senate uh, representative or your dean or your chair. I think a number of them are looking, actually, for, for new members for various reasons. So now would be a good time to have those conversations. So we have some movement on and off of these committees, as you would imagine. We have some non-voting advisory participants as well, and, and they are listed here. Uh, Rich Bray, who's managing uh, the Technical Safety Office. Uh, we have Lewis Eakins for Public Safety, and Darren Blackburn, who handles these are Strategic planning, and you've met him today. Strategic planning uh, manager, project manager. We wanted the outcomes of IEAC to be pretty clear. We wanted to eliminate the planning silos that we already had. And we knew we had these because the Northwest accreditors pointed it out, but we knew it anyway because we were encountering challenges with some facilities projects that weren't in alignment, for example, with academic program planning. We wanted to align resource allocation, in other words, budgeting, with the goals of the academic mission. And we wanted a common goal. We wanted to make sure that we're all working toward a common goal. Essentially what this does is it shifts the planning of the institution to a clear focus on academic mission. But certainly one of the goals of IAC was to accomplish this alignment across the campus. And part of the reason that we wanted it to be aligned was because we wanted the academic programs, support for the programs, and the faculty, and the students in those programs, to be the center of that planning effort. This is not something that happens overnight. It, changing all of the planning processes on a campus like ours that has thousands of employees and close to 700 faculty, it is not an overnight process. But we have made great strides, and we know we have more work to do. But we wanted you to understand where we want to go with this. And a lot of this came from feedback that we received last year as well when we did the planning for accreditation and, and had open forums for our core themes and mission statement, in which many of you said, we need better planning, we need more transparency, and we need better communication. I do want to highlight here that one of the commitments that I have 
is to utilize more effectively in this framework the expertise that we have on campus. Uh, people like me are very fortunate, or I'm unlike other CEOs that are, in, you know, that I spent the morning actually with leaders from across Pocatello, the CEOs of the companies that are based here, and they are very jealous of me because I have faculty who have expertise that they want. So we need to be better at utilizing that expertise on campus in, in, in ways that you want to provide it, of course. We, your goal, I know, is to provide education to your students and to serve your programs. But we also have opportunities on campus for strategic planning and budgeting and recruiting and retention that need faculty expertise. Uh, we plan to utilize faculty in, clean, in key planning processes like retention and recruiting. Uh, we have professionals who oversee those efforts, but we need faculty to be uh, involved in those efforts as well. And part of what we want to accomplish with IAC is that uh, utilization of faculty expertise. Some of the things that we are working on, we're implementing a new budget process campus-wide. Now many of you know that we have had what most regional comprehensive institutions have as a budget model, traditionally, incremental budgeting, which is essentially historical, based in uh, based on last year's budget, plus or minus some percentage across the board. So if we're having a great year in terms of revenue, everybody gets a 2% increase. If we're having a bad year across the board, maybe everybody gets a 5% cut. That's basically incremental budgeting. It works great if 80% of your, of your budget comes from the state and you want a very stable budget model. And you don't want a lot of flux in your budget model. But it works less well if a significant amount of your revenue does not come from the state. We are fortunate in Idaho in that we still have about 25 to 27% of our budget coming from the state appropriation. For ISU, that's about $70 million a year that comes directly to the state, uh, to, to the institution as general fund support. That's about 25 to 27% of what we spent. So we need a budget model that allows for growth and investment, which incremental budgeting doesn't really do. It maintains the status quo, it's, it's more reliable, and it's easier to manage. But what we're moving toward is more of an outcomes-based budget model that allows our deans and directors to invest in opportunities, to grow their budgets uh, through revenue opportunity, uh, growth in areas, programs, enrollments, other opportunities, in order to offset uh, losses elsewhere, for example, because of course those fluctuations occur. So we are moving toward what would be called outcomes-based budgeting. It's more complicated and it, and it means that the budget set based on the revenue that was generated uh, by that unit the previous year uh, minus uh, the overhead and then that comes to that unit for its for management of that amount in a transparent process. So we're moving that way. We don't know if we'll get it done this year entirely, but we will have a transparent budget process that's <coughs> different than what we've had before and that we hope to have be fully implemented uh, with, uh, with input from all of you on a different, entirely different budget process by FY19. By the time we are implementing the FY19 budget, we'll start the process for FY18 in about a month. And we just closed the books on 16, and we're in 17. So we have multiple budgets going all the time. I also want to mention that one of our goals has always been and continues to be to encourage and support the Faculty Senate's role in enhancing faculty governance campus-wide. Right now, the Faculty Senate is engaged in working on a number of academic policies that have needed attention for a long time. These are policies that were outdated, and we've asked the Faculty Senate to, to do that work, and Faculty Senate has also been working on policies campus-wide as well. So that takes us to questions. 
And if you have questions, you can pass those up the aisles, and we'll collect those. Can and I just read it? Try to answer them. Can I just read it if it's okay? Uh, Darren, I don't know if that we have a microphone. Paul's, Paul can read it for you. Okay. This way, uh, is this on? Is this on? Can you hear me? Is this better? Darren, this doesn't seem to be working. This one works and is removable, so we can just try that one. Okay, I'll read the questions and Dr. Woodworth and I will respond. A sexual harassment lawsuit brought against ISU was the headline in a recent article in the Idaho State Journal. In this court filing, the Dean of the College of Science and Engineering is accused of retaliation against an alleged victim of sexual harassment while working under your supervision. I'm very concerned that if this administration allows these accusations to go unchallenged, it will be catastrophic to this institution. The judge said in his ruling, quote, based on the undisputed evidence and the plaintiff's verified allegations, unquote. Please do not let us be branded as a sexist institution. I am for you for the sake of this institution and your own reputation to respond to these incredibly damaging allegations. Well, I appreciate that question and the opportunity to speak to that. I, I will say that we are challenging those accusations and we are very strongly uh, opposed to, to those allegations, uh, but we're doing it in court. And uh, we are appealing uh, that ruling and feel very, uh, very good about the strength of that case, but can't talk about the specifics of it, of course, because it's pending in the courts. And uh, we'll hopefully be able to talk more about it in, in a relatively short time frame. But we are, we are uh, objecting to that uh, and appealing it at the state level. And, and we're represented by state council. Other questions? If so, please pass the cards to Darren there in the center aisle. It's in my handwriting, though. <laughs> we're in real trouble on that one. <laughs> So you have two questions? Well, that... it's one with follow-up if needs. Okay. <laughs> President Woodworth and I. No, Pro provost. It says provost. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I couldn't read your writing. Okay, Provost Woodward and I, thank you for scheduling this meeting with the ISU faculty. I would like to invite you to share information on how you plan for open faculty positions to be filled this year, including the timeline. I have specific questions in mind which I can ask as a follow-up if you happen not to address them. Very good. <laughs> well, in terms of faculty, we, I, I know that we have a number of open lines uh, in many of your units uh, that have been temporarily put on hold. This is not a hiring freeze, so I don't want anyone to get that impression. But we are looking very carefully at hiring campus-wide. But we have a number of hires that are, are, of course, going forward right now. And so it, it's certainly a mix of approaches. But one of the things that we're concerned about is a revenue decline uh, as a result of lower international enrollment. And we are fortunate in that we have a year to plan for that. And we're in the process of launching that FY18 planning process now. So you'll be getting a lot more information about the, the revenue generated in 16. We just closed the books for FY16. Our external auditor just left campus, uh, was, was happy with our, our outcomes for FY16, and we had a good year in FY16. So our revenue decline is not going to show up until FY, the end of FY17, even though, even though we know we have it. And so what we're doing Alan, is we're looking at all of our revenue data for 16 and all of our expense data for 17 and projecting that so that we can make good decisions for FY18. We'll be sending all of that data out to the deans very shortly. We have all of the expense data as well as new 
uh, data on all of the academic affairs issues like retention and recruiting and enrollment. We'll have our census day enrollment data next week and we'll include that information as well. So we're, this is just a temporary hiatus for some of those faculty hires while we evaluate the, the financial terrain. Because the more flexibility we have in planning for 18, the better off we're going to be. So what we've asked deans and chairs to do is just think very critically about those open lines and we're hoping that we'll be able to make some decisions about some of those that are, that are currently uh, in that uh, limbo land uh, in the next month or so. So it's a, it's a temporary uh, hold on some of those lines and as we get more information about the planning process for the FY18 budget. So it's a conservative a decision to give us flexibility in that planning process, which will be transparent. I mean, our deans and chairs will get all of that data so that they can see what revenue was generated at the, at the local level as well as at the college level in all those programs. And then, of course, we're looking to you all to give us ideas, too, about the, the opportunities that exist out there in this budget process for growing enrollment. And so we want to make sure we have flexibility in the system. So I know that's a long answer. It didn't really, I'm sure it did not answer the specifics of your question. So I'll take the follow-up if you have one. There's a there's, there's one a, on iPads if you could yes, go to that. There's a little follow-up here. Uh, it is quite important to get searches started fairly soon. If we are still using the iPass system, how long do you expect it will be to have an I? Pass approved and ready to advertise after the IPASS is submitted. Well, as you may know, we speeded up the IPASS process last summer, and now we've slowed it down a bit while we wait for this data. And it, 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 we should have all of that data, uh, the census data, the expense data. I don't think Brian Hickenlooper is here, but he's telling me he thinks he'll have expense projections now it, very soon, like within the, within the next week. So we expect to make decisions about those IPASSes within the next month. Some of you have I-passes that were just, uh, the decisions were just made. So we're making decisions if it's accreditation related or if it has immediate enrollment impact or if it's line item funded or it's grant funded or it is an emergency hire, those are flowing through without delay. Uh, I can say also we are revising the I-pass process. Some of you don't have a lot of involvement with the with the increased personnel action scrutiny, I think is what it stands for, form. Uh, but we are revising it, and we are revising those processes, and you'll be seeing something different than the IPASS in the near future as well. But for right now, we're using the IPASS because it's what we have. Thank you. That probably suffices. So I'll get back to you on the details of your particular IPASS, and you can ask that. You can, Selena Grace can um, address that too. Thanks, Al. Okay, other questions? Okay, Darren. Actually, I want to read it myself, please. Okay. I, don't, I don't need an intermediary. I don't know if this is working. So. <clears throat> I'm happy to use the microphone if you can. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Laura, thanks. I'll move so that you can have feedback from me. Okay. I, I'm confused. Nope. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I got to settle two things before I ask you a real hard question. I noticed on your flow chart, um, you didn't report to anyone in your role as executive vice president. Do you report to President Bayless? I do. Yes. Okay. Is uh, it not on our, our chart? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe we should revise it. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other is a straightforward yes or no. An ISU is faculty service-related speech protected by academic freedom. Uh, yes, I'm yes, sorry. It, at ISU, is faculty service-related speech, in fact, they do teaching research service, so is our service-related speech protected by academic freedom? Uh, 
Yes, as is the employee, our employee speech as well is, is uh, protected by the First Amendment. I agree with those. So does the Ninth Circuit, so I'm pleased to hear that. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a hard question. It's hard and it's a little bit lengthy. So in the national press over the course of the last year, ISU has been portrayed as racist, religiously intolerant, and now as sexist. Furthermore, ISU is under sanction from the American Association of University Professors due to ISU's dictatorial administrative practices. Also, the Bengal community now has uh, hears news of declining enrollment, faculty flight, reduced course offerings, paid personal leave for a favorite administrator, and very painful rumors, rumors I admit, of a cover-up regarding misuse of public funds preceding the disastrous collapse of RISE. All of these failures are the responsibility of President Valis and his upper administration, including you. Why should faculty have confidence in the Valis administration in engaging in this renewal process that you discussed today? Thank you. Well, I appreciate the question. And, and certainly, I, I will speak to the, the press coverage that we had in the spring, which was, you know, as we all know, very unfortunate <coughs> and stemmed from you know, some incidents that we did have occur. Uh, certainly, that was an unfortunate situation. I feel that we have addressed much of that on campus. I certainly was heartened that our students pulled together as a commitment to addressing diversity issues. It's not something that it can be fixed overnight. We are a community of scholars, and it's our responsibility to ensure that we have open dialogue and that this is a place where everyone can feel comfortable, as Dave said, speaking their perspective. And that is my goal is to make sure that we are a community of scholars committed to diversity and open-mindedness and civility to each other and to our students. Now certainly every institution undergoes transition and we have had a lot of it in the last five years. And all of you know that. And we've had difficult times too. We have had times when we didn't have enough trust in each other to have these conversations publicly. And I think that is, is a very problematic situation. Uh, that is why, in good faith, we're having this meeting. I certainly understand that that doesn't mean uh, that everyone will feel okay after this meeting today. I recognize that it's a start, that it's a beginning. And that's, you know, that's really um, my commitment, is that I want to start that conversation in an open and civil way because we're all in this together. I mean, I have the benefit of seeing at my level what all of you do every day. And it is really amazing. It's really a heartening thing to listen to our students talk about the difficulty that they go through to get a degree here and to hear the great things they have to say about all of you, and that it's, it's transformative and life-changing. And that's really what we're here to do, is to ensure that the opportunities that we're providing our students are still here in the future. Do we have challenges? Absolutely we do. And I am committed to being transparent about those. Like regarding the RISE complex, we are investigating all of the operations in that entity. Right now it's under an external investigation and as soon as that investigation concludes, pieces of that will be public. Some personnel issues are, are involved in that investigation, so obviously we won't be able to talk about those, but I do plan to be transparent and open about the issues in that a complex that, that can be made public, and also to the future of the complex, which involves and new opportunities for uh, usage of research space, a much more open uh, approach to utilizing that facility, and uh, some instructional space as well. 
because as some of you know, we have some space challenges on lower campus that we are attempting, and some deferred maintenance issues that we're attempting to address at the same time. In terms of enrollment, you know, that has been a challenge, no question about it. It is an ongoing challenge in the state of Idaho. Our go on rate hovers around 40, we're somewhere between 48 and 50 all the time of, out of 50 states. Uh, that is, is a problem. It's a problem for the state, it's a problem for us, it's a problem for uh, the future of Idaho, and it's something that it's uh, imperative uh, that we preserve the opportunity that we provide here. We are seeing some very good uh, signs in our enrollment profile that we're happy about in the fall, that we're up in domestic students, that we think we're turning the corner on domestic Idaho students. Uh, that's a very good thing, that's a very good sign. Of course, we're down significantly in international students, and that's not surprising because we weren't expecting a Kuwaiti or Saudi incoming class. But it's a testament to the hard work of our Associate Vice President, Scott Scholes, and his team uh, that we are turning it around in high schools. Uh, we're turning it around in Bannock County in particular, which we had lost students in. And now we're up in our service region counties, so we're excited about that prospect. So I have to uh, give uh, kudos to the hard work that has been done in recruiting and admissions and all of the departments, and in particular, grad programs. Um, faculty and grad programs have really uh, done an amazing job. We're up 90 students, uh, a little over 90 uh, right now for fall. That's a huge accomplishment, so we're, we're happy about that. But we'll be transparent about it. We're not going to be up in enrollment uh, in Census Day. Uh, we were down as much as 9% over the summer, and we won't be down. We were down 2.1, I think, Scott's back there, 2.1 um, at 10th day, which is not an official uh, census day. The state board's official census day is October 15. We expect to be consistent with the 10th day, uh, I, but we'll see what it looks like next week. It's the best I can do with that question, but I appreciate your willingness to be here. And I hope that we can continue this conversation. I'm sure we will. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have a few more questions here. With the increase in committee faculty, with the increase in committee faculty needs, will the rank and promotion requirements change or be realigned? For example, less research and more service credit. What can be done to improve faculty service on campus? And that's a great question, and what I worry about uh, quite a bit, actually. I think we do need to uh, make sure that our, our tenure and promotion system and our, our reward processes for faculty are consistent with what we are asking faculty to do. And that varies pretty dramatically across the campus. So it's not something that we can put in policy at the provost level to say that all faculty will have this type of workload because we have vast differences across the disciplines and what faculty work actually looks like on a daily basis and the nature of scholarship in our various disciplines. But what has to be consistent is that we are rewarding faculty for what we are asking them to do. And that's something that we're working with our deans and chairs on. We know that our and that some of our policies need attention, and so we're asking Faculty Senate to look at some of those. Uh, there are some changes that have happened over time at the board level as well that we just need to get our policies consistent with. But that piece of the question about are we going to change a rank? Well, we're not going to change the way faculty rank functions. We just want to make sure that we're rewarding a faculty for the work they they do, and that the work that we do in our communities is important for the reputation of the institution, is important for our students, it's, a, it's an important component of our mission as an institution, maybe more important than other institutions because of the fact that we are in a rural underserved region that needs that service, and so it's important that we reward faculty for doing it and that we reward, reward them for doing it in our backyard, but nationally as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, how can we work to get more research support for faculty who are not working in the sciences and health sciences? 
Oh my goodness, that's an ongoing challenge, as some of you know. And it's something near and dear to my heart because I'm a historian. And historians do not traditionally write grant proposals. And in fact, when I was working uh, as a historian, I felt that a lot of that grant activity was taking me away from the actual book writing itself. I mean, historians write books and articles, but it's a book-centric profession. And as a result, we don't raise a lot of money. But we don't cost a lot of money either, frankly. I mean, my research was, was I didn't need a $200,000 piece of equipment to, to do what I needed to do. So I think that while it's a challenge to find ways to support those disciplines that don't have access to grant funding, it's often, uh, there are creative ways to do it. And it's often significantly less expensive to pay for, let's say, a research trip than it is to outfit a lab. And so we are looking at creative ways to do that. Uh, Niels van der Skyf and I uh, meet every week to talk about how to address research needs campus-wide, how to support, support research campus-wide, how to ensure that we have a consistency in how we apply the internal funds that we have available. Uh, certainly, uh, we are balancing that by investing in arts and letters projects and investing in science projects. Uh, science projects are more expensive, I'll just be frank about that, but we can get, sometimes we can support multiple researchers for a lot less in the arts and, and humanities. So this is a complex problem nationwide. And one that I'm concerned about in terms of maintaining the status of the humanities, and I'll just talk about that for just a moment. I think we have, as a nation, an imperative to do that. And I'm working uh, with a number of agencies in ways to facilitate support uh, for the humanities on a national scale. And this is not, I'm not to disparage any discipline here. So I'm just going to speak as a historian for a couple of seconds and then I'll move on from this. But, you know, the STEM movement is like the best marketing campaign of all time. It is important that we make sure that we are advancing our students in science, technology, engineering, and math. But it's also been an excellent marketing campaign and we need to make sure that as institutions we support multiple disciplines in multiple ways and that we ensure that our students have complex skill sets and that's something uh, that we're committed to is what makes a university a university and part of that is making sure that we have diverse research opportunities as well it's a long answer it's a difficult question and it's one that is a national challenge right now Okay, thank you. We next have a couple of questions dealing with the budget cycle. This one, can you give an example of a revenue generating program or process deans may be looking at? Examples include new programs that we currently don't have that have demand. Uh, certainly we want to make sure that deans and chairs have opportunities to invest in programs that have high demand but we currently don't offer. Uh, there are other opportunities to consolidate programs uh, to make them more attractive because of changes that have happened in that discipline. Uh, those are the types of, of program-based opportunities that exist, but there are other options as well, services that our units provide and, and are providing auxiliary income. Uh, we have uh, colleges that have significant local funding from the services that they're currently providing. They want to invest more in those opportunities so they can generate more local funds. As long as it's consistent with our mission, then we will support those. We don't want to suddenly become diverted from our mission as offering programs because we're, we are an educational institution, not a service provider of a different type. But we have uh, colleges and departments that are almost exclusively right now supported by those, those services that they are providing to the community. Most of the time it's community support and uh, the sales from those services. 
And so those are opportunities. I could give you specifics, but we could talk a long time about that. Uh, there are, we have multiple revenue streams as an institution. We have the state appropriation, as I mentioned. We have tuition. We have student fees. We have program fees. And we, we have grants and contracts. And we have auxiliary services. So those basically four different revenue streams are what are driving our budget. And any one of those, can, if any one of those expands, we have more options. And so we want to expand all of those, but we want to maintain the focus that we are an educational institution. And we're not competing with the private sector. That's not our purpose. But Bengal Pharmacy is an example of an auxiliary that is revenue generating. Okay, thank you. Two more on budgeting. You mentioned that the new budget will operate according to how much money each unit generates. Are departments considered units? No, we're looking at the at the very high level uh, le the level. Now, certainly a dean might uh, look at the revenue generated by a department, but that's a pretty micro level analysis. And we're looking at revenue generating as those streams that I talked about. So, what are we generating in tuition? What are we generating in the state allocation? We expect the state allocation to go up a little bit, actually. Uh, we're in a good situation in the state right now. So we're hoping that that goes up slightly. It went up slightly last year. Um, if we get a CEC, then uh, employee compensation package, it will go up a little bit more as a result of that as well. Uh, so we're looking at those revenue generating, um, that, that revenue generation at the, at the um, 60,000 foot level uh, and looking at how we can enhance it with tuition. Uh, we don't want to increase fees. I will say that is not a good revenue generator. Uh, student fees, we'd like to reduce those. Uh, we don't want to nickel and dime our students. Uh, we'd like to uh, make sure that we don't have too many student fees. Uh, we have program fees. Those are a different, a different animal. But uh, looking at program fees, looking at all of those revenue sources, and then looking at all of the things that we're currently funding, and this will all come to you in various ways, and determining what do we want to keep funding, and where can we grow, and where are the gaps in that process. But no, we're not looking at you know, the revenue generated by the program. It won't be that program's budget. OK, thank you. This is kind of an extension regarding performance-based budgeting. When the primary criterion is funds production, will programs with state waiver students be disadvantaged? What was the, when the primary, what was that? I'm sorry, when, Paul. when the primary criterion is funds production, that is Oh, funds production. Budget. Okay, thank you. The answer is no. So what, it's not the, it, it, at least that is what I believe we will end up doing. But we need to talk about methodology with the deans, and we haven't done that yet, and IAC in terms of how we appropriate that tuition revenue across the institution as a whole. Uh, but my feeling about that, and I'll just be honest, is that it should be an average because it's not up to the program to make it, you know, it's not the, the program, it's not in the program's control to determine uh, whether or not its students have tuition waivers or whether or not they're paying a higher rate because they're not residents and so forth. So my preference is to average that out. Now we may tell you what that is. We may tell you, you know, this program is generating, you know, has an unusual number of non-resident tuition waivers or whatever, um, just as an information item for planning purposes. But my feeling about that is that we should average that out. It's not the program's, under the program's purview, to, and we don't want it to be. We don't want you to feel like in order to, um, in order to increase your budget, you need to limit non-resident tuition waivers in your program. We don't, we do not want that kind of um, unintended consequence in our budget process. Our mission is to serve the residents of Idaho. We have other goals as well. We want to make sure the residents of Idaho have a global experience while they're here and that we want non-resident uh, non-residents as well. We're up in non-residents. We're down in international, up in domestic non-residents. That's a good sign because we want that to be a solid mix 
Uh, but our mission remains service to the domestic Idaho student. And so we don't want to penalize our units for our mission because those students are paying less. They're, paying, they're not paying in out-of-state tuition. Okay, thank you. A couple more along these lines. Will there be layoffs from a shortfall or deficit either this year or in the near future? Well, we're not uh, cutting uh, budgets in FY17, even though we know that we are over budgeted. We know we're over budgeted because we had a revenue difference between what we were projecting and what we actually have. Uh, we're working through the details of that, but we have a cushion. We're fortunate in that we have built a cushion in reserves. We have reserves to offset that one-time need. We have, we have some one-time money in reserves that we can use to offset that in FY17. FY18, we need to adjust the budgets to, to match the revenue, and that's part of why we're concerned about that revenue number in the first place, is making sure that we go through that transition. Will we have, have layoffs? Certainly, it is our intention to avoid those, which is why we are not, that's why we're scrutinizing hiring so significantly right now, is because we want that flexibility. And the institution has about $5 million in open lines at any given time. That gives us a lot of flexibility to protect us against layoffs. And so we don't, we, that's a last resort. Layoffs are absolutely a last resort. I uh, wouldn't do it unless we didn't have any other choice. It does not appear that that will be the case. So we're doing everything possible to prevent that from happening. And we have significant attrition like every institution does. Actually, on the faculty side, we have very low attrition. That's, that's normal uh, because of the tenure and promotion process limits attrition, of course. On the staff side, it's more consistent with private industry, uh, but that attrition gives us some flexibility because we're a large enough organization that we can absorb uh, some of this through attrition as well. So those are the, those are the challenge. We have some challenges, uh, but we, we plan to meet them with planning and uh, with uh, spending, lower spending decisions instead of things like layoffs. We have other options that we could put into place too and that we're looking at. We're looking at, uh, you know, nobody wants furloughs, but we will look at whether or not those generate. You know, if we ask everybody to take two unpaid days of vacation or something like that, we'll look at those, what those options look like uh, for FY18. But those are conversations that you will all be having at the local level as part of our process. So one of the things that I would not want this to ever be is a surprise. So those are questions that we will work through as we get closer to knowing uh, more about what our uh, actual expenditures are. We know we're, we're, we're hoping that we're spending less than what we budgeted. Oh, we believe that we are uh, because we have slowed down that um, hiring process significantly. That'll buy us some time. And so that's what we were hoping to do with that effort. Thank you. What are the projections for a deficit amount? Does 17 million this year and around 20 million next year sound right? A uh, 17 million number is actually a representation of, of it, it's not a deficit number. Uh, we have we know what our our revenue difference between FY 16 and FY 17 is likely to be. Now this is a projection because we're not done with FY17, obviously. But we know what our 10th day enrollment figures were, and we're projecting for summer, and summer, fall, and spring of 17 to have an $11 million revenue difference on the tuition and fee side from FY16. Uh, so that 11 million uh, figure is coming from the tuition difference. It's a projection because we don't have spring, but we're projecting what we know of fall into spring. That does not represent, though, an appropriated budget figure. That's a raw revenue figure. It doesn't mean that that has been banked in recurring salaries, for example. So what we're doing now is, in, is evaluating the expense trend for 17 to determine, project what we think the, the deficit would be 
just in recurring salaries because we have one-time money we can use to offset that one-time deficit. So what we're really worried about is, is recurring appropriated dollars. And that figure we should know, I have a much better sense of, but it's not as high as 11 million. That's the revenue difference that we're currently projecting, and that includes summer. Now, we're going to be up a little bit, in, you know, we're up in graduate, uh, we may be up in graduate again in the spring, that would offset that slightly. So these can, these can change, but they won't, it won't be a dramatic, it's going to be a $5 million swing, probably. Okay, Laura, thank you for holding this meeting. The idea of a community college in Idaho Falls could pose a real challenge, especially to our graduate programs in which we train college level teachers. Please address how ISU will meet this challenge. So uh, the community college effort in Idaho Falls has gained a lot of political backing. Uh, certainly it has the, the board, state board's backing, and it has the governor's office backing. Uh, there is considerable political effort uh, behind it. Uh, they will probably go to a vote in the spring of 17. It's, they have to create a tax district to support a community college. Of course, as you know, they're funded differently from universities. They get a tax, uh, they get a tax district that funds the per credit hour uh, charge. Uh, they're asking for $15, I think, uh, in, their, in their current proposal. And to give you an idea of how that compares, uh, C CSI, College of Southern Idaho, has, I think, a $50 um, tax for its support. CWI, do you remember what that is? 16, maybe 18, I don't remember. Maybe Scott knows, do you know? Anyway, it's a lot lower. It's a lot lower than what CSI or North Idaho College have. It'll, we'll have to see what, it, what they do. Uh, we don't know what the voters will, will do with that. They may or may not support it. At any rate, we need to plan for a community college in Idaho Falls because it's likely to happen at some point. As a result, we need to focus on our four-year programs and our graduate programs. ISU is the graduate provider for Idaho Falls as well as the four-year provider in board policy. We're not the community college provider in board policy for Idaho Falls. So it, we really need to focus our programs on the four-year and the graduate and transition from that. Uh, what has been in some ways very much a community college model in Idaho Falls to a, a four-year graduate model. I actually think that a community college will help us on the graduate side. It will create more of a pipeline in some of our programs than we currently have in IF if what they do, if what they're saying they will do, really happens. Uh, because they're talking about tapping into the 50% of residents in the Idaho Falls region that currently are not attending any post-secondary. And that number is consistent across our region as well. 50% of our high school graduates do not go to any post-secondary. So they're hoping to tap into that pool. If they do that, then it increases our pool. But that's, and that's certainly something we're committed to helping them do if they are, if they are creative. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura, I have uh, I've been told we're out of time, but there is one question that maybe you could respond to to kind of wrap this up. This was the first formal faculty meeting with faculty in over six years. Why now? You know, that is something that, that is unfortunate. I'm sorry that it has been um, so long. And so I take responsibility for not having one in the last couple of years. Uh, but. Uh, I, I know that my predecessors didn't have one either for a couple of years there. And so that is a, a not a good situation. It's not something that we want to continue. So I'm going to continue to have these meetings. Uh, I will update you on things that we are doing. I will make sure that um, you'll know when these meetings are. And uh, we will continue to have this dialogue. Why did we not have one? Uh, certainly, and why now? Uh, why now is because we have structural changes that I wanted to share with all of you. We had accreditation updates that I wanted to share with all of you. And frankly, it, it was, it's more than overdue that we have this meeting. Now, I should say that we have met regularly with faculty um, in other venues and uh, across the campus in other ways and across our campuses in other ways, uh, just not all together in this way. Uh, but it was overdue. It will keep happening. And I'm sorry there was a gap. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, make one comment about future questions. If you have questions that didn't get answered, we are out of time. Please pass them to Darren and we will pass them on to the provost who can then submit written responses and we'll organize it that way. It may go through the faculty senate to the floor, but some way we'll get responses to you. I think she's committed to answering any of your questions or concerns. So why don't we join together and give Laura a hand. to join me and thank you for your willingness to be open and thank you for all you do in our classrooms and in our labs and for our students and have a great rest of the term and we'll be back with information about the next meeting